Nationals called on the government to give struggling Kiwis some tax relief. We're going to talk about this with our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, who's with us this morning. Good morning, Prime Minister. Morena. Do we have a cost of living crisis? Well, we are, we are experiencing uh, high inflation at the moment, as is uh, as are many countries at the moment, uh, particularly uh, because of the impacts of COVID, Ryan. So that is having uh, an effect in a number of economies, but also uh, it is not projected to do that for a long time, as in it is projected to get better um, over the course of this year. But because of that, that's one of the reasons that we've done things like, for instance, say we will be lifting the minimum wage We've also increased the family tax credit because that's a way that we can target our low and middle income families with a direct increase into their pockets to help um, during this, this period where we know, for instance, things like fuel prices um, are particularly tough. So is it a crisis? Oh, I, I wouldn't describe it that, that way. Okay. There is an impact that people are feeling, undeniably, but I would not describe it um, in for, that way. OK, Ryan. for those people who are feeling the impact, and you look at the numbers from The Economist, you know, an extra four to $5,000 every year for the basics. This is food, this is rent, this is electricity. These are the basic things. Four to $5,000 so extra all of these over things, the last the 12 thing, months. That's a crisis for those so people, So the thing that it? we've always got to keep in mind, of course, is what's happening to people's income relative to their cost of living. Since we came into government, um, we know that, for instance, their incomes have been lifting more than that cost of living. Not what we're seeing year. at the moment is an exception in this period of time. And as I've said, we're not alone in that. Many countries overseas are seeing the exact same things. And it's things like the price of crude oil having increased, which we're obviously not alone in experiencing that. Uh, and of course, the, the cost of some, uh, some goods, uh, because we know that we have more demand than there is supply and we have supply constraints totally. globally. So that we're seeing the impact of that. But oh. as I say, there are predictions that that will ease. Right. And so, overall, so the, uh, incomes have tended to outstrip the cost of living. So the cost of petrol will come down? Oh, look, the cost of petrol right now, we know that what we're seeing now um, is, for instance, the impact of COVID and that recovery of many countries. So it will come we'll down. we also see the impact of the Ukraine crisis. Uh, no, not necessarily, Ryan, not with Ukraine. Um, but, of course, we know that when we're measuring inflation, of course, we're looking at a, a number of different um, factors yes, here. Yes, but, but what's it's driving it? very hard it? to predict what will happen with the cost of fuel but, um, with the Ukraine conflict. But a big part, well, but you've just said on the one hand that costs will come down. Down, you've now said you're not sure about petrol. I was talking about the infl I was talking about inflation. I don't wish to make a, a, a prediction of here about what we'll see specifically on fuel, okay. Ryan, because we know that whilst New Zealand, uh, of course, sources its uh, fuel from uh, a range of sources, predominantly R Russia and our importation there is relatively limited, uh, within the global market we're likely to see the impacts of this crisis on fuel prices. OK. Do you know what proportion of the price that we pay at the pump is tax? Uh, I have done in the past at the current prices. I know it relative uh, to the increase in crude oil. So you know it's up over you know it's up over well over a hundred dollars a barrel now. So the increase that we've seen uh, in the price of crude has outstripped the increases that have been caused by excise. It's about fifty two percent, they reckon. So more than half of what we're putting into our as, cars. As I've said, though, you know, you look at the increase we've seen at the pump um, since even last December, it's been significant, and that has not come from the increase in excise. We've said that we're but not still continuing to increase cut. excise over this term, Ryan. People have seen increases regardless. That has not come from government. It's no, come but from you're, you're still the taking range a cut, of impacts of... That's the problem. You're still taking Sorry, a cut. You're still taking a cut of that increase, it, Prime Minister. But again, Ryan, the increases that people have seen are um, far outstripped. Even if you were to remove excise increases, uh, people would um, see, have seen still that increase at the pump because it yes, is but not it would be less. Uh, predominantly would be coming half. from that space. It would be half if you guys... That, Ryan, that is... 
Brian, firstly, coming back to what excise is used for, it maintains our roads and it builds our transport projects. So if you're to remove excise, which every government has used, you basically stop your ability to maintain roads and to build new roading projects. The second point, we committed to no longer increasing excise over the course of this term. So we have not been. What people are experiencing at the pump is a result of a range of international factors that are beyond our control. Uh, we do recognise people are seeing uh, that that is causing them a cost, an increase in the cost of living, which is why we're doing things like increasing minimum wage, increasing the family tax credit to try and ease that here and now. The thing is that your opponent in Christopher Luxon has said that tax cuts are the way to go, that if you earn the money, you deserve the right to know what to spend it on. And every little counts at the moment, doesn't it, because of the cost of living crisis, although you won't use the word, the crisis that people find themselves in every single day. So I guess the thing that you have to do is convince people that you are better as a government at spending that money than they are. We, we have to talk about managing the economy and running the country as a whole. And Ryan, the point I would make is I've already listed some of the things that we're doing to try and ease things for New Zealanders right now. But the question we have to ask is that what the opposition have proposed cuts billions of dollars out of the New Zealand, um, out of uh, our revenue as a government and the ability to spend on things like health, on education. So there are two choices. They are either going to fund the, these billions of dollars worth of cuts uh, by, for instance, cutting uh, health or education, or they're going to increase debt. There's they a didn't third tell option. us yesterday how. No, there is they a third option. They did not option, tell though, us how. Yeah, there is a third option, though, Prime Minister, and that is this argument about wasteful spending that your government's been indulging in. The Provincial Growth Fund that created how many jobs? You know, the $50 million Ryan, designing the cycle Ryan, bridge that was never I, built. I'm Trevor sorry, Mallard's $500,000 slide and playground. The fees-free university money. I do money. not accept for... Um, I totally reject that. A significant amount of the spending increase that we've seen coming from government has, for instance, funded the wage subsidy, the business support we've put in what through about COVID, the, what about have the helped others? us achieve some of the lowest... If I might finish, if you're going to make an accusation of wasteful spending, I should have the right of reply on that. We have some of the lowest unemployment currently in the OECD, some of the lowest New Zealand has seen. We've kept people in work. That has made a huge difference to help us navigate this one in 100 year crisis. On top of that, we have some of the lowest uh, debt in the OECD. So even though we've been in this crisis, we've managed to keep New Zealand's debt as low as possible given the circumstances. We've also had good solid growth, again, relative to other countries. Our exporters are seeing some record exports right now. Yes, Ryan, these times are tough. We have seen the impact of inflation, but we have also seen that people predict we'll be coming out of that through the course of this year and that things will start to get better in ease. What I don't agree with is a proposal to cut billions of dollars, as the opposition have said, from the ability of government to invest in health and in education. Now is not the time to be making such moves. OK. So your government's never wasted any money? Oh, Ryan, look, of course there'll be, there'll be on occasion, you know, the odd example where perhaps we may have been able to do. I'm not going like, to speak in absolutes. Can you give us some I examples? But I also will not accept a broad brush claim that we've engaged in wasteful spending. I just don't accept that. OK. Um, very quickly, I want to talk about Ukraine, because you've announced this morning that there'll be a sanctions bill specific to Russia, which will be introduced and you'll announce today. Will that mean that the likes of Alexander... Abramov, who's a Russian oligarch who owns a $50 million estate in Northland, that that asset will be frozen? I'm not going to speak about individuals um, at this time, and we will get to a little bit more about the detail of what we'll be doing and who it will likely affect. But what we do want to make sure is that we have the ability to apply uh, sanctions to um, both entities and individuals um, where, of course, they're likely to have an impact. But I won't get into 
individuals, uh, individuals assets or individual names at this time. But the intention is for if you're an oligarch, if you're a friend of Putin's and you've got a big asset in New Zealand, that would, that would be what you'd want to target? The intention is that we have the ability to target oligarchs. One of the things that we are very mindful of is with a number of the sanctions that are being put in place across Europe, what we don't want to see is suddenly an attempt to put or investments or assets into New Zealand as a way of escaping uh, other restrictions in other areas. So we need to make sure we're protecting ourselves against that. And in terms of why you've decided to go for a Russian-specific solution to this when it could have been a more general sanctions system. Is that because you're worried about one day having to impose them on China? No. Uh, of course, you'll have already heard that there has been an autonomous sanctions bill. Um, our view was that it wasn't quite fit for purpose. We had been debating um, possible changes to it before this conflict struck. Uh, but just to name a couple of things that it wouldn't have done, it wouldn't have necessarily allowed the targeting of oligarchs. It wouldn't have, for instance, uh, enabled us to take steps against movement around our maritime uh, or airspace uh, and, and also uh, questions over whether or not it would allow, to de allow you to deal with human rights issues, cyber security issues. So so this is a bespoke bill. We think it does um, uh, the job that we need here and now, and that allows us to have a wider debate about w autonomous sanctions in the future and a more general framework for the future. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much for your time this morning, Prime Minister. Always appreciate it.